Chapter 5 Joseph and Magdalene's Sabrina swerved to miss a man on a pedal bike as she pulled into the restaurant parking lot. Her haste was wasted. A look around revealed no sign of Lindsay's roll pod. This was late, even by Lindsay's standards. A cool breeze off the ocean greeted Sabrina as she stepped out, the cush, cush of breakers and the squawk of seabirds filling her ears. The restaurant was a low, squat building made of plaster and earth with a timber roof. Square, wood-framed windows were open part way to allow the fresh sea breeze. Smoke puffed out of the wide stone chimney in the center of the building. A hanging wood sign with peeling paint squeaked in the wind. It read, Joseph and Magdalene's Seaside Restaurant. When Joseph spotted her in the doorway, he pulled himself up from a stool behind the counter, waddling a bit on stiff knees, a bright white smile under his bushy gray mustache. Sabrina moved to close the distance between them quickly, reluctant to make the old man walk any farther than necessary. He hugged her, patting her shoulders, but his smile faded quickly. What's wrong? He asked. Long day. Lindsay's late. She is always late. Joseph said, leading her to their usual table outside on the patio. Sabrina forced a smile. Joseph was right, and it was Lindsay's night after all. But Sabrina had not realized how much she had wanted to see her friend, simply to put the rest of the day's events out of her mind. The moon rose, a white marble rolling across a puddle of spilled ink. Sabrina had drained three pots of tea and watched the tables turn twice around her before she heard the faint jingle of bells Lindsay had braided into her locks. She was in an olive jacket that hugged her waist but opened up around her chest and neck, revealing the smoothness of her skin, the color of coffee and cream. A blue blouse sparkled beneath the jacket with stones that Lindsay had sewn in herself. A red sash circled her waist in place of a belt. Her twisted locks were pulled back into a ponytail, tied with a ribbon that matched her sash. Lindsay bounced on her toes at the sight of Sabrina, who sat with her arms folded. But before she could cross the patio, a couple seated at a table pulled Lindsay aside. Lindsay! The woman cried. We just love what you did with the mural on Ayers. It's even better than the one on Condorcet, the man said. Lindsay put her hand to her breast, giving Sabrina the quickest of glances. Thank you. The students worked very hard. Some of those colors, though, they are amazing. Where did you get them? the woman asked, reaching out to grab Lindsay's arm. Well, they're not actually ministry approved, she said, lowering her voice. I knew it, the husband exclaimed. Oh, Lindsay, we're so tired of the ministry-issued colors, the woman said breathlessly. We'd like to redo our own place, but we can't find any colors we like. Well, I make them myself. The couple stared at one another agog. I use plants I grow on my balcony. Stones, soil, shrubs from the desert, even a coral or two from the sea if I can find them, Lindsay said. The woman leaned forward, her face filled with the frisson of conspiracy. We will pay you handsomely if you redo our place. Magdalene said you did the interior of the restaurant, is that true? I did, she said, stealing another glance Sabrina's way. Sabrina kept her eyes fixed on the flagstone floor of the patio, tapping her foot. Fantastic, you have real talent! the husband said. What are you going to do with it? As Lindsay began to explain that she was applying to the arts program down in Lysander, Sabrina pushed out her chair, walked past them, and jumped the patio wall. She landed on the soft sand of the beach. She was rounding the corner of the building, the parking lot in sight, when Lindsay called out her name. Sabrina continued, jumping the wall of a second patio on the side of the building that was not yet open for the season. Tables and chairs stood stacked in the corner under a tarpaulin, there was a bang and a rattle as Lindsay fought with the patio gate that Sabrina had so easily hurdled. When she could not get it to open, she simply climbed over and tumbled onto the sand. Sabrina, stop! She said, trying her best to run over uneven ground. Sabrina turned to look at her friend. Firelight lit her now, the glow from the bread oven. They were beside the kitchen where Magdalene was sliding loaves of bread in and out on a wood paddle. Lindsay's sash was askew. Her palms were chalky with stone dust and her knees were sandy. One of her locks had come loose and dangled down her face so that a bell hung just below her lip. It tinkled as she brushed it aside. Sabrina, I'm sorry. I've waited two hours, Lindsay, 
I know it's your birthday, but that's a long time. I'm about to piss myself from all the tea I drank. And then you stop and chat with Sam and Susie suck up. As the fires flared within the oven, Sabrina caught the liquid gleam of tears in Lindsay's eyes. It was her 19th birthday, but she seemed years younger. Sabrina could still see in her face the girl drawing pictures in the playground dust, saving beetles in her pockets. I'm sorry, Sabrina. I just wanted them to shut up. I did, she said, wiping her eyes and shaking her head. I just wanted to be with you. It's just been a long day. Sabrina dropped down against one of the covered chairs, air hissing out from beneath the tarpaulin as she sat. No, I'm sorry. I had a terrible day. Terrible. I just wanted to forget about it. And I guess I kind of dragged it along with me. Lindsay tore the tarpaulin off another chair, dragged it over, and sat down next to Sabrina. Want to talk about it? No. Me neither. They both laughed. The sound brought Joseph out to the patio. Lindsay bounced up beside him. Joseph, my dear! Can we eat out here? They stuffed themselves with crispy flatbread topped with finely diced onions, peppers, and tomatoes drizzled in olive oil. The last customers cleared out of the back patio, and a few lingered on the beach where Joseph had one of his staff build a bonfire. Sabrina and Lindsay fell into a contented silence as they watched the silhouettes of children and their parents moving against the dancing light. Magdalene cleared the empty platter. Joseph followed her inside. The foam on the waves breaking on the beach was ghostly white in the moonlight. The air had grown chilly. Lindsay unfolded the sash from around her waist and wrapped it around her shoulders. Joseph reappeared, Magdalene following him through the doorway as he carried a honey cake, his hand curled protectively around a single candle flickering in the wind. Sabrina felt her heart skip a beat. She stood up, her chair falling to the floor behind her. Joseph, where did you get that? It's contraband! Joseph and Magdalene wore identical expressions of children caught by their parents. It's just a single candle, Joseph stammered. We thought for Lindsay's birthday it would be all right. Lindsay wore a pleading look that said, But this is Joseph and Magdalene. Joseph, Magdalene, I have to arrest people for things like this. Sabrina said, that inverted sword lying on the bloody roadway flashing in her mind. She shuddered. The couple looked over to them, their complexions soft and even, their eyes shining in the light of the candle. That light. It was almost magic, Sabrina thought before a more stringent thought replaced it. There was a reason such things were outlawed. Superstition was intoxicating, just like the illegal brews sold out of the back of pharmacies. Joseph went to blow the candle out. In its flickering light, Sabrina could see the deep creases of a frown that had formed on the corners of Lindsay's mouth. Wait, Sabrina said, raising her hand. I'll let you off with a warning. But I can't do it next time. Magdalene smiled and clasped her hands together. We're too old to be criminals. She said as her husband placed the cake and two smaller plates in front of Lindsay. When they were alone again, Lindsay carefully lifted the candle out of the soft cake, turned it so that the wax dripped onto one of the smaller plates, then stuck the candle in the cooling wax, fixing it in place. It's like you've handled a candle before, Lindsay, Sabrina said. You know me. I'm a lawbreaker. Well, since we're already breaking the law, should we do the annual prediction? Lindsay smiled conspiratorially her chair creaking as she leaned forward. I knew you would ask. It's a birthday tradition. And a much better one, I might add. No evidence, Sabrina said, gesturing to the candle. It's so sweet. I wonder where they got it. Who knows? We find contraband all the time. If it were anyone else besides Magdalene and Joseph, I'd say it was pretty sick. Stop it, Lindsay said, slapping the table. She shook her head as if warding off a chill and her smile returned. Sorry. It's just that they're our friends. I know. I'm sorry. It's not like they're occultists or something. Lindsay was quiet a long while, staring into the candle for such an extended period of time that Sabrina was about to ask if something was wrong when she looked up and said, I did not take my medication all week. I am off duty. Now who's the lawbreaker? Lindsay said with a sly smile. 
She placed her elbows on the table and leaned forward, closing her eyes and touching her fingers to her temples. The sound of the kitchen seemed to recede, the movement of the wind and sea growing to fill the void. What do we want to know? She whispered. By this time next year, will we both be in universities of our choice? By this time next year, will either of us have boyfriends? Lindsay! Lindsay's eyes snapped open. Or should I just ask if Sabrina will get laid? Stop it! Sabrina slapped her forearm, but that did nothing to quell Lindsay's laughter. Come on, let's get serious. You have my question. All right, all right. Lindsay settled back into position over the candle. She grew still before opening her eyes again. You want me to ask about Sean? She was not joking. Sabrina's mind spun. She had not even told Lindsay about her day, preferring not to lay such a burden on her friend on her birthday. Lindsay had no idea about Sean's injury, so Sabrina wondered what she could mean. Before she could think much longer, she replied as coolly as she could. No. You have my question. Lindsay nodded and closed her eyes again. The candle flickered and the wind chimes twirled and sang. She settled into a gentle rocking motion on her elbows, her face peaceful and serene as she moved into the space where she saw her visions. A drip of wax formed like a tear on the tip of the candle and rolled down its length to disappear into a spreading pool. The sea breeze moved the corners of the folded tarpaulins and caused one of Lindsay's bells to chime. The wind carried the sound of the children playing about the fire. Without warning, Lindsay jerked, kicking the table and sliding it forward as if fainting. The plates clanged and the candle fell over and died. Lindsay gasped as if struck and began to slide from her chair. Lindsay, Sabrina said. What's wrong? I didn't. I, I don't. Sabrina rushed around the table, putting her hands on Lindsay's shoulders. It's all right. I'm here. She clasped Lindsay's hand. It was cold, as if all the blood had rushed out of it. Lindsay's body was trembling, and her chest heaved like a sprinter just off the track. I'll call Magdalene, Sabrina said. No, no, Lindsay said, straightening herself in her chair. Maybe I just did not stop the medication soon enough. What happened? I don't know, she said, looking at the fallen candle. I did not see... anything. Nothing. Then I just kept trying, like trying to force it. Then it was just like this big, black nothingness came down on me. Like a blanket wrapped around me while I was under the sea, struggling to move, but sinking in darkness. Emptiness. No air, no breath. Like death. She pulled the scarf up more tightly around her shoulders, her face full of fear. Do you think I've lost the ability to see visions? To predict completely? Th that, that I've been on the drugs too long? Sabrina was unsure what to say, knowing that as a cadet, and eventually an officer, she had often hoped that Lindsay's condition would go away naturally. But seeing the heartbreak in Lindsay's face, Sabrina hated herself for wishing it. I'm sure that's what it is, Sabrina said. You just should have stopped taking the drugs sooner. You never lose something like that. Lindsay did not reply. She seemed transfixed by the candle. Sabrina stared too, the string of smoke rising up from it curled away in a breeze that felt colder. It brought to mind the curling ribbon of sand that had stretched out and disappeared beside Orhem's body. Sabrina shuddered and pushed the image out of her mind. You want some water? She asked. Yes. Sabrina went to the kitchen. When she returned with a full carafe a few moments later, Lindsay's expression was flat and mournful. By the tracks on her cheeks, Sabrina could see that she had been crying. Guilt was welling up inside her for asking for her to make a prediction in the first place. Can we walk on the beach? Lindsay asked. They removed their shoes and stepped off the patio into the sand. They walked in silence for a long distance before they turned around, facing the restaurant and the bonfire that still leapt up at the night sky. Lindsay had the look of someone trying to shake a bad dream. Let's build a sandcastle, she suggested. 
The logs of the fire settled into a steady smolder. Parents wrapped themselves in blankets as their children joined Sabrina and Lindsay as they constructed castle walls, turrets, and a keep. It was not the most lavish of castles, since they only had broken seashells and sticks to work with as tools, but Lindsay's skill showed through. Soon there were windows, eaves, and parapets, complete with merlins and crenels. A shining city on a hill, Lindsay said in her best mockery of one of Sabrina's Uncle D'Agosta's old audio com addresses. She stood back from their finished work and held her broken shell over her head. They burst out laughing. They wrapped their arms around one another as they walked to the parking lot. Lindsay's purple CRP, or the bean as she called it, was beside Sabrina's. Lindsay lifted the windscreen to the roll pod, then halted, holding the half-sphere up over her head. Sabrina, I don't want to be alone tonight. No problem, Sabrina said. I'll follow you home. She trailed Lindsay north on the Bay Road as the lights of the city shimmered over the water and the crowns of the hills moved closer. Lindsay drove like an old woman, slow and careful like always. It took an effort on Sabrina's part not to follow too closely. She glanced up as a floodlight flared on the side of Hill 34. For an instant, she could catch the glint of fences and razor mesh. She was too far away to see the intruder, but she could follow his path as one light went out and another blazed. By now, she knew that a pair of cadets was already likely descending upon the unfortunate Skrit. From her last time on duty, after processing her own prisoner, she had checked the records from the past three years. Incidences of Skrits on the hills had risen, just like the reports of code violations and violence in the cities. The thought made her stomach queasy, but her Uncle Dagosta had not betrayed any worry, and so she resolved that she wouldn't either. Sabrina parked beside Lindsay in the parking deck and followed her up the bland and empty stairwell to the seventh floor. The building was ministry-designed, standard in its layout, and identical to Sabrina's own apartment building but for the doors which were decorated uniquely by each resident. The walls were blank but for cracks and a sign indicating which days reclamation materials could be set outside. Another sign listed names of residents and which days they were assigned to community duties. Lindsay Medina was the only name written in purple glitter ink. Lindsay's keys jangled in the lock. The inside of her apartment was a welcome contrast to the corridor. A sea breeze wafted through the open windows and gently filled the curtains. The sterile smell of concrete and construction resin was replaced by the scent of earthen pots and the pheasant eyes, hollyhocks, and anemone that grew on a balcony. Like her murals, Lindsay's apartment was painted in non-standard colors, the bedroom in soft sky blue, the kitchenette cove in warm earth tones, and the sitting area a welcoming cheery orange. Only her workspace near the window was white, but this had more to do with the light. An easel with a mess of paints on its tray stood near the window. A number of sculptures in various stages of completion stood nearby. The artwork migrated around the room from there. Paintings adorned the walls, figurines perched on tabletops, Tapestries hung from door frames leading into the hallway, the bedroom, and the kitchen. As always, Sabrina took it all in slowly, savoring the vivid feel. Lindsay seemed too tired or too accustomed to her work to take notice. She disappeared into the bathroom, ran the water, then re-emerged in pajamas. After rearranging the cushions on the couch and pulling out its sleeping mattress, she dropped down onto it, flicking on the view screen. Sabrina went to the bathroom to wash her face. She took her time examining the octopus Lindsay had painted into the corner of the wall. By using the perspective of the converging surfaces, she had created the illusion that the octopus was reaching out towards the viewer. The illusion made her slightly dizzy as she brushed her teeth with the toothbrush she kept under Lindsay's sink. They sat in bed, each curled under a blanket, facing the video panel. Lindsay did not last five minutes. Her soft, rhythmic breathing told Sabrina that she was sound asleep and would not wake until morning just as it had been when they were little. It always took longer for Sabrina's body to find the relaxation required for sleep. A picture frame sat on the table beside the couch. Sleek, silver, and simple, it was a stark contrast to the rest of the apartment. This was intended. Sabrina had given it to Lindsay a year earlier. It was supposed to represent Sabrina's own taste, while Lindsay had given her the same picture in a frame that reflected her own distinct style. The picture showed Lindsay her parents, her brother Sam, and Sabrina at the beach. Sam was still a boy, 
and Lindsay and Sabrina still had the bodies of girls under their swimsuits. Lindsay's family had been Sabrina's refuge of normalcy growing up, an escape from the institutional grounds of the head ministry. Her uncle D'Agosta had been unendingly kind and generous to her, but despite his generosity and his power, there were things he could not do, like take her to the beach or the market. He was the head minister, tasked with governing their world within the walls, their protector, their savior. It would not do for him to appear at the beach in swim trunks. She knew more than others how the head ministry was a prison to him. But Lindsay and her parents, under a shroud of normalcy, could take her such places. It was with them that she made her first visit to the market. She had accompanied Dagosta on inspection trips to the farms south of the city where their food was produced, but he never took her to loud, bustling, colorful markets where buyers and sellers haggled over prices. Why he had granted Sabrina such beneficence over other orphans she would never know, and did not question out of some fear he might reconsider and the spell might be broken. He had saved her from a tragic life. Both her parents had been killed in a traffic accident. She had no memory of it, thankfully. There was no pain of loss that way. She did not even know their names. Her earliest memory did not even include them. She was four, and D'Agosta holding her in his arms was on what must have been one of her first tours of the head ministry building. They were standing before a shining silver orb floating within a glass column. He had only taken her there once, and she had never seen it again. Yet the memory persisted. She turned her attention to the view panel. The vids at this time of night were all from before the cataclysm and the transition, as if only in the dead of night could the ghosts of the past reemerge. Sabrina flicked through vids of old pitch ball matches, animated shows, and nature documentaries. The vids had been screened and censored to eliminate inappropriate references to nations, faiths, or beliefs. But, to a careful watcher, they still revealed secrets, and, being an insomniac, Sabrina had become an expert at finding references the censors had missed on the late-night vids. Late one night, Sabrina had seen a vid of a pitchball match, in which a player, after scoring, had looked up and made a motion as if sending kisses skyward. Sabrina had recoiled in revulsion and told her uncle immediately the next morning. He gravely explained to her that such hideous expressions were once common, even during public events. Sabrina never saw the vid played again. The nature docus revealed to her what the planet had looked like 100 years ago, before the radioactive fires had scorched its face. There had been green forests, seas of waving grass and high mountains, not like the dusty hills of Fortinbras, but towering masses with jagged black peaks and rivers of snow. Snow! Flowing down them in currents that moved like stone, just inches at a time. It made her sad to think that all these places had been made inhospitable now to biological life, all by faiths that claimed to cherish the very planet they had destroyed. She felt herself beginning to drift by the third vid, one where colorful girl heroes flew through the air to fight forces of unquestionable evil. She closed her eyes to the sound of their high-pitched voices accompanied by explosions and the cries of their enemies. In sleep, she went to that place almost all her dreams inevitably led her, a pink room with white curtains moving in the breeze. She heard the sound of a siren. Her eyes were fixed on a painting, a sailboat in a wide open sea. If she looked to her right, she would see blue forget-me-nots on the windowsill. But she could never make herself look in that direction, despite the many times she had been in this room in countless dreams. Then the room was gone. She was somewhere else, standing before that polished silver orb, Dagosta's warm, gravelly voice filling her ear. This is our failsafe, our last salvation, his voice seemed to catch. A solution that is final. A blood-red face in the sun. Into your weapons, I send my— She snapped awake. Her skin was wet with sweat, and her heart pounded in her chest. Her comm cube was buzzing on the table beside her. She slapped it, then opened the view screen. It was a message from Dagosta. Apparently, he was having trouble sleeping as well. Come see me first thing in the morning. Anything else can wait. She rolled over to check on Lindsay. She was still sound asleep. Sabrina slipped out of bed and put her shoes back on, her fingers threading the laces slowly as her heartbeat settled. The sun would not rise for another two hours. She knew she would not be able to get back to sleep. In the kitchen, fanciful creatures with antennae, horns, and wings— 
stared at her as she drank a glass of water. They were Lindsay's ceramic pill jars, their ridiculous appearance a cover for the seriousness of the prescriptions they contained. She drank as unanswered questions hung in her mind regarding which schools they would be accepted into, where they would be living in a year, how many more birthdays they would share together. She put down the glass quietly. Worry was a wasted emotion. At least that was what her uncle had told her. She went to the door and closed it softly behind her. Happy birthday, my friend. Here's to many more. <laughs>